Across 25 seasons of Big Brother, there have been a total of 333 players. Of these 333 players, only 25 have won the game. Of these 25 winners, 7 of them have played in more than one season. Of these 7, only 2 have placed 1st and 2nd across 2 different seasons. And of these 2, only one of them is widely regarded as the greatest player of all time. I'm of course talking about Dan Giesling. In this video, we will not only cover Dan's two spectacular seasons of gameplay, but the one move that single-handedly made him into a legend, his own funeral. Obviously the last 24 hours for me were pretty tough. I'm dressed in all black for a reason. I want to welcome you guys all to my big brother funeral. If you're unfamiliar with Big Brother, I imagine you have some questions. I mean, I get it. How the hell can someone be good at a reality TV show? For many of you, I imagine being good at a reality TV show means being as untalented and as obnoxious as possible. And you know what? Okay, fair enough. If you're not a big reality TV person, I totally get it. But let's start off by first explaining what Big Brother is all about. Its rules, its strategies, some of its players, and everything in between. If you're already aware of how the game works, feel free to skip to this timestamp. For everyone else, let me get you up to speed. First, what even is Big Brother? Big Brother is a reality TV show that aired in 2000, right at the start of the reality TV boom sparked by Survivor. The first season actually performed horrendously but there's one thing Big Brother had to its advantage over any other reality TV show back then, and even now. Most shows air on TV for their time slot, and once the episode is over, that's it until the next episode. But what makes Big Brother special is that it is streamed for 24 hours a day. This was made possible by the fact that the Big Brother house is filled to the brim with cameras. For instance, Season 25 utilized a total of 94 cameras and 113 microphones, making the entirety of the house visible. Anyone with access to the internet can go onto the Big Brother website and see what the house guests are doing in real time. If this is your first time hearing about this, I understand a lot of you might be thinking, why the hell would I want to watch that? And to be honest, I actually had the same reaction. I thought it was really silly and stupid. But uh, let me just say this. After getting into the show, it's a really cool way you can keep up with the program in real time. If there's something interesting happening, like a fight, you can watch it happen live before seeing it on the episode. Unless, of course, it doesn't make it onto the episode. In that case, the feats are cool because you can see things that were left out of the episodes. For instance, last season of the show had this really huge fight that lasted over an hour. It was super entertaining, but... Of course, the show had to chop it down to just a couple minutes. If it weren't for the live feeds, there would have been no way for the audience to watch and appreciate the fireworks of this fight. There are so many interesting situations and interactions that get cut from the episodes, so the live feeds are an integral part of the viewing experience for many viewers. It just makes the show much more raw and captivating. It's pure, unfiltered, and unedited. Okay, so you can watch 24-7. That's great, but what exactly are we watching? What is the point of the show? How does one win? Let's break down the rules of the game. Every summer, a group of approximately 16 strangers from across the country are brought into the Big Brother house. The Big Brother house has no phones, no internet, no TV, 
nothing. You have a few games like pool, chess, and some knickknacks here and there, but it's pretty much just you and your roommates. I haven't talked to you in three days. You didn't, didn't campaign to me. You, you, I, I cannot. Disgusting. At the start of each week, every single player plays what is called the head of household competition. This usually consists of something mental or physical or some combination of the two. The winner of this competition then becomes the head of household, or the HOH for short. Being the HOH means a couple of things. Number one, you are completely safe for the week. There is no chance of you going home. And number two, you must nominate two people to be evicted from the Big Brother house. It is then at the nomination ceremony where the HOH names who they are nominating for eviction. Being nominated for eviction is usually referred to as being on the block, just so you know. While being nominated for eviction is no good, nominated players have one final shot at safety with the veto competition. The veto competition is played every week with six players. The current week's HOH, the two nominated house guests, and three random house guests. Whoever wins the competition is awarded with the power of veto, or the POV for short. Here's how the veto works. After the veto competition comes the veto ceremony. If a person who has been nominated for eviction wins the veto, they can use it on themselves to be removed from the block, and the HOH must therefore name a replacement nominee. If the HOH or one of the randomly drawn house guests wins the veto, they too can use it. The one thing I gotta mention though, is that if one of the players not on the block uses the veto on a nominated player, they cannot be the replacement nominee as the veto still applies to them. With that being said, they are not obligated to use the veto whatsoever. And technically, someone on the block doesn't have to use the veto either, but that would just be stupid. <laughs> You'd want to use the veto, it's, it's dumb. My sisters, my brothers, my mama, they're sitting at home and they're like, use the veto, fool! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to use it. I don't want you to have to decide between them. I don't want you guys to go through the moment that I went through this week. As harsh and as terrible as it is, you should have used the veto. I'm sorry, but I vote to evict you, Marcellus. First of all, first of all, Marcellus, I need to do this to you. It's not unusual for the veto to go unused if a nominated house guest or the HOH wins. Once the veto has or has not been used, the nominations are finalized and every player aside from the HOH and the two nominated house guests privately vote for who they want to be evicted. The votes are then tallied and whoever ends up with the most votes is evicted. After an eviction, a new head of household competition is played where the outgoing HOH is ineligible to play and the cycle then repeats. So a typical Big Brother week consists of an HOH competition, a nomination ceremony, a veto competition, a veto ceremony, and an eviction. The cycle then repeats until the game goes from 16 players to two. When the game is down to these final two players, a jury of the seven or nine previously evicted house guests have the opportunity to speak with the finalists and then vote for the winner. As you might have already guessed, one player leaving a week with 16 players would take a long time. And you're right, the game of Big Brother goes on for months. Last season went on for 100 days. But that's basically it. As far as the actual rules of the game go, just make it to the end of the game and win. Simple, right? Now, here's the thing. Knowing the rules of Big Brother is not the same as actually playing Big Brother. I'm sure most of you know the rules of basketball, but do you know about the Princeton offense strategy? Yeah, me neither, dude. Like any game or sport, there are rules, but more importantly, there are strategies. Based on just the rules of the game, some may assume the best strategy to win is to just constantly win vetoes or HOHs. Well, no. Not only would that strategy actually make you a huge target in the eyes of the other players, but it's just straight up impossible to win challenges every week. Well, unless your name is Jack Baines, in that case, congratulations. While HOHs and vetoes are important, the true game of Big Brother is the social game. The social game is 
really hard to describe to someone if they're unfamiliar with these kinds of shows because it's not like any other game I can think of. There's no scoreboard, goals, or touchdowns. It's invisible. It's the game between you and your fellow players. In my reality TV video, Big Brother content creator Ethanamel honestly did a perfect job of explaining the social game, so I'm going to read an excerpt of his segment. Quote, At the most basic level, a player's social game is just how they interact with the other players. From there, it extends to a player's ability to build strong enough relationships with the other players to the point where they can leverage their relationships to help them win the game. For a simple example, let's say that you're on a season of Big Brother and it's towards the end of week one. Player A and player B are two players on the block and you have a different relationship with the two of them. Player A spent the first few days in the house getting to know you. They kept you company, they listened when you talked, and overall, you found yourself enjoying hanging out with them. Player B, on the other hand, had barely talked to you. They seemed to give you the cold shoulder for no reason, they made no effort to get to know you, and you got a lot of negative vibes from them. The vast majority of people would probably prefer to keep player A around because you've developed a good relationship with them, so the likely outcome is that you vote player B off." Unquote. Indeed, having a good social game can go a long way. In this example, player A made you feel comfortable, and therefore convinced you to keep them around. Player B was rude and standoffish, so you voted them off. If we continue on with this example, if you were to maintain your relationship with player A, this could help you later on in the game. If player A ever wins an HOH competition, they would almost certainly keep you safe from eviction, but, more importantly, because of your good relationship, you could perhaps influence their decision making. You're therefore utilizing and weaponizing your social game to get rid of players who are in your way or are trying to get you out. So the social game can be used to keep yourself safe, but to also influence the game. You don't need to win any competitions to make a difference in how the game plays out. Of course, this is a very basic example. In the actual game, there are lots of players, people form alliances, and people can lie to you. It can be hard to know who to trust and what the best course of action is in any given scenario. Additionally, a good social game doesn't just mean you're trying to be friends with everyone. People talk in these games. A lot. The most valuable thing to have in this game is information. If people start to feel like you're playing all sides, they'll realize the game you're playing and will almost certainly come to the conclusion you're untrustworthy. On the contrary, you also can't be too quiet or under the radar, or you will get sussed out for that too. The game is incredibly complex. It's not like a game of chess where you have the position right in front of you. You have to play the game based on the information you're given. Even then, people can lie to you. It is up to the players to accurately assess their position in the game and react accordingly. If there's one game I can compare Big Brother to, it's actually poker. In poker, you have a certain amount of information and you must make decisions based on your knowledge, experience, and intuition. And just like in poker, people can bluff and play psychological games. It's up to the players to accurately read the situation in front of them. While you can get dealt a bad hand, you can still bluff and end up turning the situation on its head. Similarly, a player might get dealt a bad hand with maybe a bad HOH or a bad veto outcome, but there are still options available to them at all times. Again, it's really complex and I could honestly make an entire video dedicated to the social game, but it's one of those things you just understand more and more as you watch Big Brother or Survivor. Brittany is your friend? Yep. Nobody in this house is your real friend, Reagan. Nobody likes you in real life. Really? This is a game. If this is your gameplay, you really suck at it. I figure the best way to explain the social game is to just give an example. So I'm going to give two real examples from the show. I'll start off by demonstrating someone who had a very bad social game, Frenchie. Frenchie was a player who was cast for Big Brother 23 and actually won the first HOH competition. Under normal circumstances, this is a very good thing to happen because people usually try to get in good with the first HOH so as to not be nominated. So this helps the first HOH establish bonds and alliances early in the game. While this is a golden opportunity, again, 
even a player who has been dealt a good hand can botch it. When Frenchie was crowned the first HOH, he started talking game immediately, and his first order of business was declaring that no woman or person of color would be nominated under his reign. Being a fan of the show, I'm not going to do the things that fans expect and nominate the usual suspects. I'm about to shake things up. His goal was to flip the script and target a strong white male for the first week. So this meant he promised 12 out of the 15 house guests safety for the first week. His initial target was Brent, followed by Christian as a backup target, then Travis. After the end of the first night, Brent comes to talk with Frenchie and eventually wins him over. Frenchie then decides to promise Brent safety too. Frenchie then sets his sight on Christian as his primary target. Unfortunately for Frenchie, Christian ends up winning safety for the week in this twist wildcard competition, so he is now safe for the week. And by that point, Frenchie had also promised Travis safety as well. So you see the problem here? By the end of his first few days as head of household, Frenchie promised every single player in the house safety. So no matter what nominations he made, he was going to piss some people off and be seen as untrustworthy. So he then came up with some nonsensical reasons to nominate Alyssa and Kyland, directly breaking his promise not to nominate women or people of color. Aside from false promises, Frenchie also played way too hard. He attempted to form this massive alliance, which failed because there were so many people in it and it seemed like members were constantly changing. So all in all, Frenchie was a bad social player because he obviously lied, was extremely untrustworthy, and overall seemed disingenuous. So in the following week, Frenchie went home by a vote of 11 to 1. So hopefully you get the idea of how a bad social player will get the boot. So, Frenchie was a bad player because he lied, he was untrustworthy, and he was disingenuous. Well, yeah, but most importantly, it's because he got caught. I now want to talk about a Big Brother winner who lied, was untrustworthy, and so disingenuous, but had the social game to pull it off. Andy Heron. Andy was cast on BB15, and what made him stand out was his ability to lie effectively and on the spot. On top of that, he managed to keep good relationships with everyone because of how good his social game was. In the Big Brother community, there's this very well-known clip of Andy winning a head of household competition, and literally every single house gets feeling comfortable that they would not get nominated. I feel cool with Andy winning this HOH. You know, we've got a good relationship, so I should be safe. I think me and Andy are uh, pretty cool, you know? We were from the beginning. This could be the best possible scenario. I'm really happy that Andy won HOH. We're really good friends. Andy and I jive very well together. He's my closest ally in the house. I feel more than comfortable that Andy won HOH. To demonstrate just how good this man was at lying and manipulating, I want to talk about what I think was his finest hour in the Big Brother house, voting out Amanda at the final seven. While I would love to get into the nitty gritty details of this, this video would end up being more about Andy than Dan, so I'm going to try to boil it down in just a few minutes. At the final seven, player Gina Maria wins the head of household competition, which is good for Andy. And there's even better news. She's nominating Amanda and McRae, who are a powerful couple. That meant that one of his ops would be leaving the house and Andy wouldn't have to get any of the blood on his hands. The vote looked like it was going to be three to one to evict Amanda. Perfect. Now, unfortunately, Andy got a bad outcome when McRae won the veto. Gina Marie had to name a replacement nominee and she was forced to nominate Spencer, who was a vote to evict Amanda. This caused problems for Andy. You see, the Exterminator Alliance was convinced that Andy would vote off Amanda which of course he would. But McCray, Alyssa, and Amanda were convinced Andy was voting off Spencer. So Andy found himself in a tough situation where someone would end up being blindsided by the vote. Ugh. I am in a very compromising position because I'm friends with Amanda and McCray and they think I'm still completely working with them. But in fact, I am working with the exterminators to exterminate Amanda and McCray. And so I need to basically toe the line as best I can. 
The way the votes were set up now is that it would be a 2-2 two to two vote where Gina Marie would cast the deciding vote to evict Amanda. Judd and Andy were voting Amanda off, while Alyssa and McCray were voting Spencer off. So what does Andy do? Well, he obviously can't just tell McCray and Alyssa he's not voting with them, because if they win the next head of household competition, he would certainly be their next target for betraying them. It's very crucial for my game this week that Amanda and McCray think that I am in no way a part of this decision because one of them is going to stay. And if they know that I flip, they're going to come after me. And I do not want that happening. So he devised a plan with the exterminators to vote Amanda off, but pinned the flipped vote on Alyssa so that if McCray won the head of household next week, he would put her up. It was a risky play, but an absolutely necessary one to make that late in the game. So on eviction night, Andy votes off Amanda, leaving McCray dumbfounded. And wouldn't you know it, McCray won the next HOH competition. Andy gets to work immediately and actually convinces McCray it was Alyssa who flipped. McCray wins HOH and he has to immediately make his nominations and I know that going through his head is which one of Andy and Alyssa voted Amanda out. And it is my mission to make him believe 100% that I have never faltered from my alliance with him and that I should be trusted over Alyssa. Even though I should definitely not be trusted whatsoever. I don't know which one. Are you kidding me? I don't know. Are you kidding me? Like, who is that with you? Please. Who comes to, okay. to me every week? Who, I'm not an idiot, McCray. Don't be stupid. Andy was so convincing in his performance that McCray then nominates Alyssa and she gets evicted even though she was the only person left in the house working with him. So Andy successfully used his social game to take out two very tough competitors that were in his way, all without a single scratch on him. McCray was still convinced Andy was on his side and he still had the exterminators with him because he didn't break their trust. When McCray nominates Alyssa, I am so relieved. I made the riskiest move I have made all game by voting Amanda out and lying to McCray. And it could have gone so wrong in so many ways, but it has not. It's worked out and it seems like everything is going exactly as I planned it. This is the social game. Andy didn't have to win anything to get his way. Just clever plays and a convincing performance. Andy was a phenomenal player who played a ruthless game, which ultimately led to him winning his season. So now that we've gone through some examples, I'm hoping you're understanding more how the social game works. You not only have to be strategic with what you say and how you say it, but you also have to be convincing. A good social player like Andy can lie and manipulate others into maintaining a good position in the game. Whereas a bad social player like Frenchy will lie and get the boot because of it. Andy was dealt a bad hand, but made it work. Frenchy was dealt a good hand, but fumbled it. I'll say it again, Big Brother is an incredibly hard game where one must be ready to prepare and improvise for any situation. And when it comes to a killer social game, there's of course the one player who we came to talk about today, Dan Giesling. And go kick their ass! I'm Dan Giesling, and I was the winner of Big Brother 10. Dan played on two seasons, Big Brother 10 and Big Brother 14. We'll start off by talking about his Big Brother 10 game first. I have so much to say about his Big Brother 10 game, but let me call my boy who I know can do it justice. Peridium! Bullmaster, thank you for having me on. Internet, hey, what's up? We enjoying a good talk about Big Brother, about the social game? So, who am I again? What, what do I do? Here's the deal. I'm over in a different part of the YouTube universe where I talk all about reality TV. I run a channel called Peridium where I talk about Big Brother and Survivor. I've been doing it now for seven years. I drop a new video every week. I've been a fan since 2010 and I cover a wide range of topics about these shows. And uh, yeah, when it comes to this particular video, it won't be the first time I've talked about Dan Giesling from Big Brother 10 
And if you peep my channel in a few weeks, it also won't be the last. From over 350 players to ever set foot in the Big Brother house over the past 24 years, I can confidently say Dan is my favorite player. And a large part of that is because of just how damn good he is at playing the game, the social game, how he bends the game to his will. He is a master tactician who swings for the fences and loves to mug for the camera while he's doing it, just, you know, a sly wink and a nod, because just as much as he's in the thick of it, so are we, the audience. We're right there with him. Dan is the magic man. His style of gameplay is often designed around the concept of perception. Not just how he perceives the rest of the players in the game, but how they perceive him and how he wants them to perceive him. He often likes to feed others a perception of him that is less than savory. That is, the rest of the cast looks down on him, doesn't think much of him, and ultimately underestimates him. He lies in the shadows and waits, bides his time. He lets his seeds slowly grow. He gives himself ample time to cook. And through two seasons, he has fed himself and us quite well. So, okay, there's a lot of hype, but what does he actually do? Well, okay, for example, at the end of the first week on season 10, the first time that he played, his closest ally was about to get evicted. Wait, sorry, what? Uh, yeah, so not the best start to a winning game to have your closest ally walking out the door in week one, but it happens. Despite the rest of the house ditching Dan's ally, Brian, and everyone voting against him, getting him evicted by the end of the first week, Dan chose to display loyalty to Brian and voted to keep him. Dan was the only person to do so, to go down with the ship. Even though a lot of other people did like Brian, Dan was the only one to stick by him. But in truth, he actually wanted to show the rest of the house that he was loyal to those who were loyal to him. He took a lemon and squeezed about as much juice as he could a few drops out of it because if the rest of the cast saw that he was loyal in spite of the fact that Brian was going, it would establish a reputation for Dan that he had the traits of someone to work with in the future. Look at him stick up for his buddy who's going out the door, deservedly so. You could count on him. I gave Brian my word. Right. And even though I was exposed and I was hung out to dry, I still gave my word, so that's why I voted. Stan Vass. Dan, yeah, he was on the other side, but he straight came up to me and said, I'll give you that same loyalty. I can take that into consideration to farther myself in the game. I mean, that's huge. In week two, Dan was in the firing line and threw one of the competitions, the veto, that would have gained him safety had he won it. By my estimation, as somebody who's watched a lot of these reality competition shows, very few people in the history of these shows, especially Big Brother, do this. They just don't throw competitions. They're not incentivized to. They almost always gun for it. But Dan wanted his perception in the game to be that of someone who wasn't a strong player in competitions. If he won them, people would look at him sideways and go, well, yeah, this guy's a threat. We need to get him out. He would regularly, purposefully lose them early to appear weak. Coming in this competition, I need to continue to build a weak persona in this house so that I can skate by another week. So I need to throw the competition, risk a lot, but gain a lot. A lot of people think it would be insane to throw your only chance, but you know what? It's so insane that it just might work. His entire first half of his game on Big Brother 10 is predicated on this notion that he wasn't a threat to win anything, a competition, a power, and certainly not the game. This perception would pay off for him in weeks three and four when the season split wide open and drama ensued amongst literally everyone else in the house but Dan. In a cast of 10 players, nine of them got into a major spat, the biggest fight in Big Brother history still to this day, and yet Dan was the one player who didn't get involved at all. Dan never fought with anyone, not through the entire season. Despite having many people at many different times yelling at him to his face, uh, you will always be Judas in my house. I understand that. He was loyal, peaceful, and not a threat. He had both sides of the house believing that he was on their side. But if you ask any fan to describe Dan Giesling in three words, I don't think loyal, peaceful, and unthreatening would be very apt, would they? Dan's masterstroke was convincing his closest ally, Memphis, to want to take him to the final two by the end of the season. 
In the second half of the game, Dan turned it up to 11 and scorched most of the rest of the cast by betraying them, blowing their games up, and by winning a bunch of comps. He held the most power by far, a stark contrast to the first half, and yet he convinced Memphis to want to take him to the end to face the jury because his pitch was simple. Memphis, look upon all the ruin I have caused. Look how this jury is going to perceive me. I am a madman. They hate me. You think they'll respect that. Memphis saw this reality that Dan wanted him to see and bought into it, and it cost him half a million dollars. But that's the rub. In between all of this, Dan was actually keeping it cordial, not fighting, not making it personal. It was all game. And I think to put the cap on all of it, when he sat there and talked to the jury at the end next to Memphis, he was able to explain all of this. He made it make sense. And he knew from his repeated days in the game with all of these jurors that they knew he wasn't making it up. He really was that loyal, peaceful, unthreatening guy outside of the game. But inside the house, it's a different story. But then again, the jury isn't inside the house, are they? Perception is reality, and Dan wasn't a madman, he was a magic man. This was his fun house with smoke and warped mirrors, and that is how he ultimately won Big Brother 10. Ollie's vote goes to the winner of Big Brother 10. And that's all I gotta say about Dan for now. Although I will be getting into more of the nitty gritty of his game on my channel in the near future if you're interested to hear more about how he exactly won that crown. Otherwise, Bull, thank you for having me on. Back to you, man. If you're not already subbed to Peridium, please make sure to take a second to check out his channel. This man knows Survivor and Big Brother like the back of his hand and is definitely worth checking out. I want to give him a big thank you for appearing in this video. My boy killed it. Season 10 made Dan a fan favorite, but season 14 is what made him into a legend. It was during this season that Dan performed the greatest move in the history of the show, and some even consider it to be the greatest moment in reality TV, period. Let's get into it. Season 14 had a twist where there would be four returning contestants on the show. Dan, Boogie, Brittany, and Janelle. Because Dan had already won the game, he was a threat to the other players right out of the gates. This season had so many interesting characters. You had Frank, who was outspoken and brash, but a complete competition beast. You had Ian, who seemed nerdy and weird, but ended up being quite the force to be reckoned with. You had Danielle, who was just Labrador levels of loyal. Brittany from season 12 made a return, and she is most well known for great confessionals. Captain America, I mean Shane, was on the season two. Lastly, I have to mention Jen, who was the biggest coaster of the season, but we love her for it. Tough competition was in the house, but Dan is Dan so he still managed to form connections, and one of those connections happened to be with Frank. To explain their relationship, I gotta explain this interesting thing that sometimes happens in Big Brother, and life. Sometimes there are relationships that are really one-sided. Just like Tom in 500 Days of Summer, sometimes a player might overvalue the relationship they have with another player. This usually results in said player giving up way too much information for too little in return, or just keeping someone around who doesn't have their best interests in mind. In season 14, this seemed to be the case with Frank. Frank had been a fan of the show for a long time, and it was his dream to come onto the show. Being an active viewer of the show, Frank loved the game, including its players. So when Frank saw Dan enter the Big Brother house, he was ecstatic. Frank was a big fan of his, which prompted Frank to want to work with Dan. From Frank's point of view, it seemed like Dan reciprocated the feelings. But unbeknownst to Frank, Dan was actively planning to vote him out as soon as possible. What Frank was missing in this situation was some key information. In Big Brother 14, the house dynamics played out in an interesting way. I want to give you an overview of the battlefield. There were two important alliances that were in play this season. The first one was the Silent Six, consisting of Dan, 
Brittany, Shane, Danielle, Boogie, and Frank. While Dan, Frank, and Boogie were allegedly working together within the Silent Six, Dan was actively plotting against Frank and Boogie, and Boogie was also trying to go after Dan. There was some cracks in this alliance. Frank telling me that he considered backdooring me tells me that I can't trust him. If you're gonna entertain the thought to backdoor me right now, you're definitely gonna do it at a later part in this game. If I get the opportunity to shank Frank in this game, I'm gonna do it. After the Silent Six had been formed, Frank and Boogie eventually left the HOH room, leaving the other four members alone. These four decided to bring Ian upstairs and now make a five-person alliance with him named the Quack Pack. While this was initially a bit of a joke, it would prove to be the central part of the game. I'm very excited about Ian committing to me, Brittany, Shane, and Danielle because he's a trustworthy number and that's gonna help me get further in this game. Ian had a close relationship with Frank and Boogie but was not loyal to them. So anything that they would plan, Ian would run it back to the Quack Pack. Ian was effectively an informant to the Quack Pack, or as they call it in the Big Brother house, a rat. Even though Boogie and Frank still think I'm playing with them, my true alliance is the Quack Pack. So if it's better for myself and the Quack Pack for Boogie and Frank to go up this week, that's just what has to happen. I'm the giant rat that makes all of the rules. With information from Ian, the Quack Pack realized that they needed to get rid of Frank and Boogie because they were secretly going after Brittany and Shane in the future. So on week six, Shane wins HOH and he nominates Frank and Boogie. Frank won the veto and it was Boogie who got booted. Boogie, you are evicted from the Big Brother house. Frank and Boogie were pissed, really pissed. Only problem is that they were pissed at the wrong guy. They blamed Dan for the alliance turning on them, not Ian. He's, he's good. Dan likes to play silent, but the guy's really just Satan. He likes to pretend he's the Catholic schoolboy, and he's not. So I'm sitting here taking all this heat from Mike Boogie, and everyone knows I'm never gonna crack under pressure. Bullying doesn't work on me. But the interesting thing is, is that Ian's sitting there watching this all happen. I just hope you realize how much heat I'm taking for him and understands what I'm doing for the kid. They had no idea about the Quack Pack or Ian being an informant to Dan and his group. So while Ian was the real snake of the operation, it was Dan who took all the heat from Frank and Boogie. From that point forward, Frank was set on doing everything in his power to get Dan out of the game. But unfortunately for Frank, everyone else was trying to get him out. Although everyone wanted Frank out, Frank was making that a really difficult task. In the first six weeks of the game, Frank had been nominated for eviction five times. The house wanted him out, but he was an amazing competitor. In those six weeks, he managed to win an impressive two HOHs and three vetoes. He was really only vulnerable for one out of the six weeks. It would have been two, but one eviction was canceled. Frank was no fool, and he obviously realized that he was on thin ice. And because of this, his anger for Dan only grew as he felt this was all his fault. At the start of week seven, Frank won the HOH and he had no doubt in his mind who he was going to nominate. Frank wins the HOH. I'm in trouble. There's no doubt in my mind who he's gonna put up, but I'm gonna do whatever it takes to stay in this house, and I'm gonna slither my way out this week one way or another. I know that Frank wants to target Dan, but he has to put two people up on the block, and considering I just nominated him about an hour and a half ago, things aren't looking very good. Despite Dan trying to convince Frank otherwise, Frank nominated Dan and his closest ally, Danielle. Dan had a final two set in place with Danielle, who had been his ride or die since day one. Frank knew they were close, so he figured he would put them both up, and if Dan managed to win the veto, he could at least ensure he would send his closest ally home. While Dan was put in a really bad spot, that week there happened to be two vetoes up for grabs, meaning that both Dan and Danielle could potentially come off the block. Ian the Rat ended up winning the first power veto, 
and was therefore unable to participate in that week's veto competition. While Dan wrestled with Ian to use the power of veto on him, Ian ultimately decided it was not in his best interest, as that would reveal to Frank that he had been secretly working with Dan this whole time, and ultimately damage his position in the house. Again, Frank was still fully of the belief that Dan was the reason for Boogie's eviction, not Ian. The consensus in the house was that Dan would be voted out over Danielle, so Dan's only shot at survival would be to win this veto. The veto competition would be played later that week, and it was pretty straightforward. Players would have to identify the word an artist was trying to convey. They would have a word bank and the number of letters in the word. The first person to buzz in and guess correctly would win points, and the player with the most points would win the power of veto. I should also mention, some of the words would require some kind of punishment for the person to receive the points. Carrot. That is correct. Boom! Yes! Congratulations, Frank. And to earn the points, you'll need to wear this fashionable carrot costume <laughs> for a week. Rocket. All I know is at this point, I've had an avocado bath, a chum bath, and I'm wearing a carrot costume. I just gotta hope that I at least win this POV and all these punishments are for nothing. Frank, being the competition beast he was, took a leap with 22 points. Dan then manages to score 8 points, but only if he agrees to go into solitary confinement for 24 hours. While this punishment might not seem like anything crazy, it's important to remember that socializing is your livelihood in this game. Being alone for 24 hours means that Dan would essentially be on the bench for an entire day. If Dan didn't win this veto, he would not only be unable to save himself, but he would also be incapable of socializing or strategizing. It was risky, but being in the position he was in, Dan went all in and took the 8 points. The game progresses. During the final round, the winner would get 11 points. Dan has 13 points, Frank has 22. If Dan managed to answer correctly, he could beat Frank and win the veto. But surprisingly, something interesting occurred. Frank or Dan, if either of you get this right, will be the winner. Brittany, what is your answer? You already hit it, right? Yeah, but I don't, know. I don't think I know what it is. Frank, uh, there is a very clear rule that you are not allowed to communicate with other house guests in the competition. You whispered the word summer, and unfortunately you have been eliminated as a result. What? This is incredible. Frank self-eliminates because he cheats, and I'm standing with the sole lead in this game. I actually have a shot to win this competition. With Frank now out of the competition, Dan was now in the lead with 13 points. But with 11 points on the line, his lead didn't mean much. Next right answer would win the veto. This was it. His last hope. Let's look at a dramatic piece of art that is worth 11 points. Brittany, what is your answer? Um. Brittany, since you were unable to come up with an answer, the drawing will resume. My answer is ticket. Jen, you're safe. Frank's not necessarily alone in this game, okay? So I'm like, baby, it's go time. You have every chance in the world to win this and keep those nominations the same. I'm gonna be on slot for the rest of the summer. Congratulations, Jen. That gives you a total of 15 points to win the power of Vito. Dan didn't win, and that means Dan you're going to jury. I'm sorry, buddy, but immediately after this competition, I'm being sent to solitary confinement. I've got to think of a plan to get myself out of this trouble that I'm in right now. This was it for Dan. It was over. Jen won the veto, who he was not close with, and the house was set on voting him out over Danielle. It was a done deal. Ian was not going to budge on using the veto, and... Jenna was just set on doing whatever Frank wished. 
Frank had been pushing to get Dan out to everyone all week, and nothing was going to change his mind. Dan was now without a veto and out of the game for 24 hours. Just him and his thoughts for 24 hours. On the live feeds, Dan looked defeated. He was so down and so desperate, he even scoured the room for a hidden veto. With no hope left, Dan was praying for something. Anything. But over the course of his solitary confinement, something seemed to change within him. While he entered with doom and gloom, he suddenly seemed animated and locked in. He started plotting, thinking of what he would do to get himself out of this situation. He's got to save himself, but he also doesn't want to lose his number one. He's got this information about Ian, but how does he sell it to the guy who literally vowed to get him out? For an entire day, Dan thought and thought and thought. While the 24 hours was intended to be a punishment, Dan took advantage of the time he was given and went into a deep thought about what to do. He came to one conclusion. In order for him to keep living in the Big Brother house, he would first have to die. As Dan starts to feel a little bit better, he tells me that he wants to have a house meeting where he can address all of us. I don't know, I guess get something off of his chest. Obviously the last 24 hours for me were pretty tough. I've been dressed in all black for a reason. I want to welcome you guys all to my big brother funeral. Joe, being around you, you taught me a lot about how to be a good husband. You know, Shane's walking living proof there actually is a Captain America. Um, <laughs> the one and only Jen City. You're the first lesbian I ever met. And I just want you to make sure that you know how much you've touched me. Ian, the more and more I was around you, the more you reminded myself. Because you love this place for everything it's worth. Right. The guy in the character, Frank. There's a couple things I've said about you that I'm not proud of. You know, there's something that I want to read to you upstairs and apologize to you face to face in private. So then finally, I know there's Danielle. The last time I played this game, I learned a lot of tough lessons early on. And I learned that you got to find one person and put 100% of your trust in it. I thought if I picked you, you would have similar qualities to Memphis Garrett. And through my own fault, I was wrong. We don't need to get into it now, but in this game, you'll never earn my trust back. You know what you did. And in this game, you're dead to me. So don't come to me and ask about it because it's over. Moving forward, we can be friends outside of this. I'll be friends with all of you. But the game talk for me ends now. So I hope you guys understand that, that this was the death of Dan the player. I want the rest of the experience to be fun for everyone and not off. I really appreciate it. <laughs> did I really go crazy in solitary confinement? Or did I come up with a master plan to get myself out of this mess? <sighs> you didn't do anything. I don't know what that was. <laughs> What was that? Yeah, he said 24 hours to think about what to do and how to get himself out of the jam. This is his way of like getting Same us goodbye. to keep him? No, no, no there's no, something no, else. No, there's there's something weird. Weird. Somebody told him something. No one talked to him. He went, right he he went straight into there. solitary. While I was trapped in solitary confinement, I came up with a master plan to try and save myself. Step one, invite all the house guests to Dan's funeral. Step two, go talk to Frank and blow up the quack pack. I brought this Bible up here, not to read to you, but to swear on. So I got you and Mike in front of everyone. I didn't do that. You're gonna find out how it went down and what happened. The Silent Six was formed. Prior to that, there was an alliance created. Not with four people, with five people. Man, you know, this guy duped me, you know? This kid's ruthless. I was in such a bad spot, and then here I am. I'm taking heat for this kid. Yeah. And he's covered at every angle. I want him out next. This is my pitch to you. 
Brittany's a more dangerous player. She's covered everywhere. Covered by you. Joe's not going to put her up. Ian's not going to put her up. Shane's not going to put her up. Who is going to put Brittany in? For as tight as I feel with Ian, there's not a doubt in my mind he's tighter with Brittany. I was completely by myself, so I had to try to work with Ian, Shane, and Brittany. But now, it turns out they've been lying to me for a week. No one would ever think we'd be working together. But if I went to Jen and said, Jen, I know this might sound a little crazy, but I want you to use the veto on Dan, I think she might do it. I've been worried about somebody that might take me to the final two, and now it seems like Dan might be that person. I was willing to swear in the Bible to go to the end with Frank, and the crazy thing is, I actually mean it. Final two? Yeah, final two, man. We gotta come up with a name, though. We'll figure one out. So now that I've got Frank on board, it's now time to do absolute damage control with Danielle. I've gotta pull her in alone and calm her down and let her know this was all an act. I told you I'd never do it again. I did. <laughs> If my plan works, think of this. I'm gonna be off the block from a guy who put on a carrot suit, took an avocado bath, took a chum bath, and sat out of an HOH competition all to get me out. I may have a future in sales selling ice to Eskimos if I can pull this thing off. This is a veto meeting. Danielle and Dan have been nominated for eviction. Ian and I each have the power to veto one of Frank's nominations. I have decided not to use the power of video. This is strictly a game move, and it's for my personal game. I have decided. To use the power of veto. On Dan. Frank, since I have decided to veto one of your nominations, you have to name a replacement. Ian, you voted Mike out last week, and then you put me and my other closest ally up on the block, and she went home. You won the veto, so I can't put you up. I got to do the next best thing and put your closest ally up on the block. You made it apparent who that is. So to quote a not-so-wise young man, Brittany, pop a squat. This veto meeting is a journey. Jen just used a veto on me. Do you understand what just happened? My crazy plan worked, and I'm in this house to stay. People thought I was dead. Guess what? I'm back stronger than ever, and you can't stop me. Dan mind fucked everyone in the house. Like truly. Julie Chen Moonves, the host of the show, said that she has never seen as big a comeback as this. I'm serious. This move was pretty much the equivalent of the Patriots comeback versus the Falcons at the Super Bowl. 
This move was Mango beating Zane twice on Final Destination. I guarantee if you swap Dan out with any other player in that position, they would have gone home. It was so meticulously planned and executed, and it really paid off. It's hard to even begin to try to explain how this move worked, but I'll give it a shot. Let me give you a lay of the battlefield from Dan's point of view and how I feel his thought process might have looked like. Him and his number one are on the block and he needs to save both of them. Therefore, he must get someone to use the veto. Ian is a no-go. He wrestled with him for days and Ian is set on not using it. Jen also has a veto and is set on doing whatever Frank wants. But of course, Frank hates Dan, so no way in hell is he going to tell her to use the veto. This was how the cards were laid out, so from there, Dan had to strategize a game plan. Dan realized he needed to get Jen to use the veto, but more importantly, he needs Frank to convince Jen to use the veto. So he started to think of how he can make peace with Frank and work with him. So Dan called a house meeting and acted like he was genuinely going home and just wanted to say some nice things before leaving the game. But the ending was crucial. Everyone anticipated Dan was going to say something sweet to Danielle, but he called her out instead, seemingly without any reason. This was a very strategic choice from Dan. He didn't believe what he was saying, but he needed everyone in the house to believe him and Danielle would no longer work together. Therefore, the two of them as a pair no longer seemed like a threat. If I could break me and Danielle up in the public eye, then all of a sudden Shane moves up with Danielle and they're going to get put up. I'm not going to get put up against Danielle. And so I used all that chaos and everything to go make a deal with Frank. And Since no one knew where this change of pace was coming from, chaos ensued and the house was flipped on its head. Using the chaos as a smokescreen, Dan immediately goes to talk with Frank. Since Dan framed his funeral as if he was for sure going home, no one suspected the two of them were talking game but instead that Dan was legitimately apologizing to him. Now talking with Frank, Dan decides to write out Ian. I have to stress, Dan held on to this for weeks, until the last hour. Not only did he drop this bomb of information to Frank, but more importantly, he sold it. His delivery made him able to come off as genuine to Frank, which helped him build some trust with him. Saying he built trust is actually an understatement on my end, because Dan somehow duped Frank into a final two deal with him. Let me say that again. Dan convinced Frank into a final two deal with him. This man hated Dan so much, he literally wore this carrot suit for a week to get him out. I have never seen a player have this much Jedi level mind control over a house guest. This man has psychic powers. So after this talk, Frank now saw Ian as his new biggest enemy, but because Ian won the veto, Frank couldn't name him as a replacement nominee, so he decides he'll nominate Brittany, his closest ally. From there, Jen was convinced by Frank to save Dan, and the rest was history. Brittany was named the replacement nominee, and was evicted with four votes. Dan's funeral is the greatest move in Big Brother history. Out of the 333 contestants, who have played across 25 seasons of Big Brother, put any of them in the same spot and they get evicted. I will bet my life on this. No other player would have even considered doing something as theatrical and complex as this. No other player. The rest of his Big Brother 14 game was just magical. Backstabbing people left and right. Convincing Ian and Danielle to throw competitions for him. Blindsiding Shane at the final four. Just incredible. He played so well that he even made it to the final two for a second time. He was up against Ian, who ended up winning this season because the jury was very bitter towards Dan's ruthless gameplay. While some acknowledged he played an incredible game, they simply didn't want to see him win twice. If you ask a fan who they think should have won, they'd probably say Dan. In fact, many feel he was robbed of this game. Not to say Ian played a bad game by any means, but what Dan pulled off was fucking legendary. It is something that will never be repeated again. It doesn't matter if there's going to be 500 seasons of Big Brother, nothing will ever top this. Not in Big Brother, nor reality TV, period. Dan's funeral 
was actually the very first clip of Big Brother I had ever seen. I had no idea what the show was about, nor did I have any context behind what was happening. Despite my lack of knowledge, I remember being captivated. I was so intrigued by the creativity and performance Dan was able to produce. In a game that seemingly has endless options, Dan is somehow able to find moves or plays that are just so out there. Not only are they wildly creative, but they work. Dan reminds me a lot of one of my favorite chess players, Mikhail Tao. Tao was known for having a wild style that was incredibly risky, sacrificing pieces left and right, making crazy moves, but it always seemed to work out for him. When asked about his approach to the game, Tao's most famous quote was, you must take your opponent to a deep dark forest where two plus two equals five and the path leading out is only wide enough for one. Dan's funeral was this. Dan took every single member of the house into a deep dark forest and only he came out of it. If you're unfamiliar with Big Brother and you've somehow made it to the end of this video, give it a shot. You're gonna have to put up with some really obnoxious editing and some horrible production choices now and then, but you'll also get some incredibly entertaining moments and some good gameplay and fun. And hey, this current season isn't over yet. Who knows? Maybe the next Dan Geesling is in the Big Brother house as we speak. Hey guys, it's Bullmaster here. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things at the end of this video. I'm really excited that this video is finally out. And if you made it to the end, I want to say a big, big thank you. That means a lot to me. Uh, I know I've been uploading rather slowly, but you guys, I hope you can understand that I edit on top of a full-time job and YouTube is just something I do as a hobby or more of a part-time job. And uh, as much as I would love to upload sooner, um, I also really value the quality in my videos. So. You know, if things get a little slow sometimes, just know it's because I want to give you guys the highest quality video I can give. And I'd rather you have something good, like really, really good in a couple of months than a couple of months than something like that you wouldn't care for. You know what I mean? Because uh, one thing I really value is a uh, replay value, because I think right now the body of work I've made is um, it's really strong. And I think it's stuff that you can watch whenever. And still get a lot of out of not to toot my own horn or sound like whatever but i just think you know you can rewatch it um and it, get some stuff out of it and so um yeah i also just wanted to say thank you to of course my special guest uh Peridium, who is a very very kind man and it was very fun working with him on this video he knows big brother and survivor so so well he can probably get you can ask him anything about any season and he'll, he'll tell you it so uh make sure to check out his channel um he's really if you found this stuff interesting like yeah please do so and ethan Amel. i love my boy ethan Amel, so check him out too uh they're both super knowledgeable and super kind and hardworking, and uh i appreciate them very much and speaking of appreciations i also want to give a thank you to uh, mrs becky blair who made my thumbnail i'm going to include links to uh her twitter and her social medias in my description uh she made this beautiful hand drawn thumbnail for me and she made it exactly the way i asked her to and i'm so so happy uh with how it came out and so i just wanted to give her a big thank you because uh i can't draw like that so and uh, i just knew i wanted this thumbnail to, in particular to be hand drawn because um, a lot of the old big brother footage is very grainy and it, i just figured it wouldn't look good so i really wanted this one to look nice and crispy and it was accomplished so i want to give a big big thank you thank you so much becky and um again thank you to my patrons uh christian bradley and bad b uh you guys mean a lot to me you guys have been here for such a long time and uh, i really appreciate you guys so thank you very much and yeah once again just thank you for watching the video i worked really hard on it and you know uh i'll try to get a video out by Halloween time sometime around then. I really want to do Long Legs or Evil Dead. Uh, I might run a poll, but we'll just see. But again, thank you guys so much. You guys mean a lot to me, especially if you guys have stuck around after I switched from Melee content. That means a lot because I know I say that all the time, but I know a lot of people signed up for Melee and I don't do that anymore, but um, I'm hoping that you guys like the new stuff as well. So yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening to me ramble. Peace.